As we've seen, truth tables are a really nice tool to have in order to assess semantic properties of statements, arguments, and so on. And there's a lot of advantages to truth tables, the main advantage being that they're actually quite easy to do. Once you know how to set it up, it's very easy to sort of set up all your rows and columns, and then you can just mechanically go through and evaluate the truth. Now, of course, the main con of these truth tables is that they can explode to become huge very quickly. Remember that we have two to the n rows based on n being the number of atomics. So we haven't looked at anything greater than three, but if we had a statement that had six, seven, eight atomic letters, or if we had an argument that had like six premises and a massive conclusion, our table would just be so big that it'd be really tedious to do. So that's not too bad because we know that we can get a computer to do something like a truth table pretty much instantaneously. So it's still a really good thing to be able to know how to do and interpret. But still, in terms of sort of just assessing semantic properties, uh, truth tables, full truth tables, aren't really the most useful because they're so unwieldy. So is it the case that we really need a full truth table to assess semantic properties? And the answer is no, but it actually depends what semantic properties that we're talking about. So here's the chart of all the semantic properties. And if you take a close look, we can actually divide them into two broad categories. The first category are semantic properties that actually require us to know something about the full truth table of a statement, set of statements, or argument. For example, to know that something's a tautology, you need to know that every single TVA yields true as the truth value. But of course, this would require us to have a full truth table at our disposal. Same for contradiction, inconsistent logical equivalence, and valid. Remember, for valid, we need to know that every single TVA is safe, safe in the sense that we don't get true premises and false conclusion. So the ones that I've marked in red here, it seems we need a full truth table for. But if you look at the rest, the ones that I've marked in green, consistent, contingent, and invalid, these actually only require us to know one or two rows of a full truth table. So we can actually just have a single TVA, and that would allow us to know what the semantic property is. So for example, consistency, if we had a single TVA that just showed that all the sentences were true, that's enough to know the set is consistent. And for invalid, if we had a single TVA, which was enough to show that all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false, then we have enough information to know that the argument is invalid. We can actually use this information and invoke what's called a shortened truth table. And a shortened truth table is essentially a shortcut just to generate a singular TVA. And this is really nice because then we can demonstrate all those properties in green. Actually, it's even a bit more powerful than that. If you think about the red properties, the things like uh, tautology, we needed to show that every single TVA is true for tautology. But we can actually, with a shortened truth table, show the negation of these properties. So I can show that a statement is not a tautology very quickly by generating a single TVA where the sentence is false. And I can show a statement is not a contradiction by generating a single TVA where the sentence is true. And in fact, because some of our properties are actually the opposite of each other, we can actually demonstrate lots more than we expected. So the opposite of inconsistency is consistency. So if I show something's consistent, then it's not inconsistent. And the opposite of validity is invalidity. So if I show something's not valid, it's invalid. And so these are the types of properties that we're really going to aim to show with shortened truth tables. The process for shortened truth tables is very straightforward. It's actually like a little logical puzzle. And once you get used to it, they're really satisfying to do. So I'm going to walk through the sort of basic steps. But as always, the best way to learn this is through examples. So we'll do a couple quick examples here. And then you'll want to look at some of my example demonstration videos for some more guidance. So the first thing you want to do is identify the main connective of all your statements uh, of anything you're looking at. This is pretty much what you want to do for everything in the entire course. And then after that, you're going to want to set the truth values of the main connectives to what you need. What do I mean by that? We'll see in the first example. A shortened truth table essentially works backwards compared to a full truth table. In a full truth table, we work from atomics upwards towards our connective truth. But in the shortened truth table, we actually work backwards and we go from the connectives 
down to the atomics. And so we want to actually solve our connectives first. So that means that it's really advantageous to know which is the best connectives to work with. And those are always the ones with the unique cases, the lowest number of cases of possibility, which we've talked about before. Always remember when you solve something, you want to carry it through to all the atomic letters and you want to apply it so that you can solve more. Okay, a lot of this is quite abstract. Let's get to an example. So in this example, I want to show that the following sentence is not a contradiction. So typically, a contradiction would be a sentence where every single TVA is false. But in this case, I want to show that there is at least one TVA that is true. Because if I can just get a single TVA where this statement is true, then I've done enough to show that it's not a contradiction. Now, I haven't shown that it's a tautology. I haven't shown that it's contingent. I'm just showing what is required. So what you want to know is what the answer actually will look like in this type of question. The solution we're going for is just to generate a singular TVA, which is a single row of a truth table that is uniquely defined by the combination of truth of the atomic letters. So in this example, my atomic letters are P, Q, W. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some work, but ultimately my solution is just that P, Q, W little table there, which picks out a unique TVA. That's my ultimate answer. So the first step is to find the main connective, and we will set it to the truth value we want. So take a second, find it, and the truth value we want here is clearly for the sentence to be true, because I want it to be not a contradiction. So there's the main connective, and I write a little t above it, which indicates that the sentence is true. Now what we do is we work outwards now, and we try and filter this truth down, because we know that truth is truth functional. So if this conjunction, which is what the statement is, because that's what the main connective is, is true. What do I know about either conjunct? Well, according to the truth table of conjunction, but really just according to what you know and means, we know that both sides must be true if the overall and statement is true. So this is a nice unique case. So now I just need to know what both sides are. Remember, when I ask what a side is or what something is, I'm talking about the main connective. So what's the left main connective and what's the right main connective? Take a second, find it, and hopefully you agree that at the left conjunct, the main connective is the biconditional, and the right conjunct, the main connective is the negation. Now, I just sort of follow through with the truth value. If I know that the conjunction is true, then I know each conjunct is also true. So I write a little t above those connectives there. And you can sort of see where this is going at this point. I'm just going to keep applying the truth till I get to some hard information about P, Q, and W. Looking at the left conjunct, we have a problem. The problem is the biconditional has two cases where it can be true. It's true when both sides are the same. So either W is true and the other side is also true, or W is false and the other side is also false. But the problem here is that I don't know which case is the right case, and I really shouldn't guess. Some harder truth tables, you do have to guess, but you always want to guess at the very last possible moment when you have no other choice. So instead, I'm going to look at the right conjunct, which is the negation. The negation is unique. If a negation is true, whatever is modifying must be false. So what is it modifying? The negation is modifying the main connective of what's on the inside. And the inside is W conditional Q. So of course, the main connective of that is the conditional, which means the conditional must be false. And again, I'm just going to distribute slowly the truth values. If a conditional is false, is that a unique case? The answer is yes. A conditional is false in only one case when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. So we go ahead and follow through on that and write a T and an F. Now I'm writing the truth values for my atomic letters underneath and my truth values for the connectives on top. You don't have to do that. I just find that's a really nice bookkeeping system so I don't have T's and F's everywhere and then get confused about what I wrote them on. So once I have these truth values, I'm ready to write them in the table because I know now that W is true and Q is false. But if that's the case, W is true and Q is false over the entire statement. So I can immediately follow through and apply those truth values to the rest of my statement wherever I see W and wherever I see Q, and I get the following. I've now fully solved the right conjunct of this statement, but I now need to solve the left conjunct. So let's take a closer look. Here's what I know for sure. 
I know that the biconditional is true, but I also know that the left side of the biconditional, which is W, is also true. So for a biconditional to be true, like I said before, both sides need to be the same. So that means the right side of the biconditional also has to have a true truth value. And what is the right side? The right side is the main connective, which is the negation. So I put the negation in as true, and I immediately know that what it's modifying is false. And so that means that disjunction, Q or P, must be false. So now I just zero in on the very last section, which I haven't solved, that's Q or P. I know that the overall statement is false. I know that Q is false. But the thing is, OR is false in only one unique case, when both disjuncts are false. So automatically, I know that P is false. I fill it in my table, and that is the final answer. So the final answer is just that thing in the corner, PQWFFT, and that highlights a single TVA where this statement is true, and that's enough to show that the statement is not a contradiction. Clearly, it's really helpful to know your minimal cases. This is the table from last time, so again, you can take a look at it for your reference. But it's really important because you never want to be working on something that isn't a unique case unless you have no other choice. You also really need to know your semantic properties. So here's an overall summary of your semantic properties as interpreted into shortened truth tables. So if you want to show that a statement is not a tautology, you need to show the main connective is false. Similarly, if it's not a contradiction, you need to show that the main connective is true. For contingency, you would have to make two shortened truth tables, one TVA that shows a statement is true, one TVA that shows it's false. You cannot show logical equivalence in a shortened truth table, but you can show that they're not logically equivalent by getting a TVA where the sentences have different truth values. Consistency, all sentences in the set must be true. In, uh, not inconsistent, well, that's the exact same thing as consistency, all sentences are true. And the last important one is if you want to show that an argument is invalid, you need a TVA where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Let's take a look at an example of invalidity. Here's an argument. It's quite straightforward, two premises and a conclusion. And I want to show that it's invalid. Now notice that I've written the table in the corner, PQRSW. So there's five atomic letters here, and if I was to do a full truth table, it would take me forever. There would be lots of rows. Instead, we can use the shortened one just to get a shortcut straight to a single TVA, which shows invalidity. Remember, the first step is to find the main connectives. So take a look and find them. The first premise and the second premise are reasonably straightforward. The conclusion is a little trickier because I have negation, conditional, and disjunction all on the same level. But we know from the hierarchy of connectives that the conditional, the arrows, dominate over everything else. So it's the conditional that's the main connective. After that, I need to set the truth values. To show invalidity, I must have a TVA where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So I go ahead and do that. After this, it's just a game of sort of moving around where you get information about truth and you apply that information elsewhere to help you solve other things. So we just sort of go proceed as normal and whenever we're stuck, we just move on. So if you look at the first premise, the negation is true, which means that whatever is modifying, whatever is on the inside, must be false. And of course, we know that what it's modifying on the inside is the main connective, and so that's the biconditional. So the biconditional is false. Now, if I try to keep going, I get stuck because the biconditional has two cases where it's false. It's either true-false or false-true, as long as they're different, and I don't know which one it is, so I should move on. If I look at the second premise, the disjunction is true, and I might think to work there, but actually that's not a unique case either. The unique case for the disjunction is when both sides are false, but if it's true, I don't know which case it is. They could both be true, or one disjunction could be true, the other false or vice versa. So I really cannot start there either. Then I look at the conclusion, and I see that the conclusion is that the conditional is false, and this is great, because a conditional false is a unique case where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And from here, I can keep going. If negation R is true, clearly R must be false. And then if P or S is false, if a disjunction is false, that's also unique, that means P as well as S are false. So once I know this, I put that information into my table as follows, and I make sure that I carry that truth all the way to the rest of my question. So here, P 
uh, R and S are all set to be false. So now I know enough information, I can really start on premise 1 or premise 2, it doesn't actually matter. Looking at the biconditional from the first premise, we see that the biconditional is false. And that means that both sides have to be different, like we said earlier. So if the P is false, I know that the negation Q must be true. So let's put a true above the negation, and of course that immediately means that Q is false, and I can write that in, put it in my table, and carry it through. In this case, there's nowhere else to carry it through, but that's fine. Then in premise two, I can focus and take a look, and that disjunction is true, but I know that S, the left disjunct, is false. So if I know that the left disjunct is false, it must be the case that the right disjunct is true. So what is the right disjunct? Remember, it's the main connective. So the main connective here is the conditional. So that truth value flows to the conditional, and that means the conditional itself must be true. So how do I know what to do here? A conditional true has three cases, but the consequent here is already solved for me. The consequent is R and P, where R and P are both false. Well, it doesn't really matter that they both are. Just in virtue of the fact that one of them is false, I know that the conjunction is false. So here, I have a conditional, where I don't know the value of the antecedent, but I know that the consequent is false. So if I want it to be true, the, when I say it, I mean the conditional. If I want the conditional to be true, I must avoid one case. I must avoid true antecedent, false consequent. So in order to avoid that, I have to ensure that the antecedent is false, because otherwise I would get true false, and that'd be a problem. So I set the antecedent to be false, which is the negation, and of course that makes w immediately true, and now I put it in my table, and I'm done. So I've shown here that this argument is invalid, because I generated a TVA where both premises are true and the conclusion is false at the same time, and invalidity requires just one example, one TVA, one row of a full truth table where this is so, and we can conclude that the entire argument is invalid. Short and truth tables are nice, they're pretty fun, uh, they just require you to know the truth tables of your connectives, which I've been trying to convince you that you know already. There's nothing to memorize here about how conjunction and disjunction work. You really want to rely on your natural language, intuition, and understanding of these words to sort of help you through these things. Clearly, the most important skill is being able to identify main connectives, sub-main connectives, and so on. You really need to also know informal notation because informal notation is how your questions will be written for the most part, and that's where you will need to sort of think about what the main connective is. Finally, you do need to know your semantic properties so you know what truth values to set your statements on. In this video, we only practiced a couple of semantic properties, but we'll look at some other ones in some of the demonstration examples, and of course there's lots of practice questions out there.